Welcome everybody. We'll just wait for a couple of minutes for the attendees, okay? Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll just wait for a couple of minutes before we start. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Belle and I am your host for today. And we are presenting foot care, ingrown toenails, fungus, and warts, presented by Amanda Birch, our chiropodist and foot care specialist. And um, just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your control panel. And I'll bring them up during the presentation. We will also have time for questions at the end. I will pass the presentation to Amanda Birch. Okay, okay. hi everyone. Can you hear me, Bill? Yes. Okay, so we're not sure what's going on with the video, um, so you might not be able to see me. Um, so can you work on that, Bell? It just says that you've stopped me from using it. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, we can get started. So just go back to the front, the first page. Nope, yeah. Okay, so um, hopefully you'll be able to see me eventually, everyone. But um, until then, um, my name's Amanda. I am the chiropodist at Physio Mobility. Um, I've done quite a few of these um, webinars and people find them extremely helpful. I decided to start with um, 
I decided to start with this one this time because um, I've been seeing a lot of this lately. And I think what's going on is I think after summer, you know, you've been you've been walking bare feet, you had nail polish on or whatever it may be. Um, you're starting to notice um, certain things. So um, I've been seeing a lot of ingrown toenails because the transition from, you know, sandals to closed toe shoes. Um, your feet are now in a more closed pack space. So ingrowns can start to happen. Fungus um, and warts, you know, if you've been walking barefoot, you had that nail polish on, you removed it and it's discolored on the nail. So um, all sorts of things. So uh, I thought this would be a great opportunity to kind of educate everyone and just to kind of see what's going on and how to treat it. Okay, so the first one we're going to start with is um, ingrown toenails. So ingrown toenails, or the medical word is called onychocryptosis or perinichia. Perinichia just describes an infected ingrown toenail. Um, and essentially, um, there's a few main causes. So there's many different reasons you can get ingrowns. Like a lot of people always think um, Pretty much if you have your nail has broken off um, and it's, you know, it's digging into skin, that's the only kind of ingrown. But there's many different versions of an ingrown um, that um, can happen. So some causes are micro trauma. So, you know, something um, little, you've stubbed your toe, um, your shoe, your foot is touching the end of your shoe, something very small like that. It doesn't have to, you don't have to notice it. It doesn't have to be painful. It's just something that um, is repetitive and happens over and over and over again, where um, you can also get an ingrown from a major trauma. You really stubbed your toe um, or you dropped a weight on it or something like that. Um, oh, it's going to work. I don't know if you can see me. Uh, um, something that um, is impacted. Um, the second one is a footwear. So a lot of people, I think, don't realize how narrow um, their footwear actually is. Um, a lot of the times with my patients, uh, I will draw their foot and then I'll take their insole out and kind of compare it. And there are actually a lot of people who are quite baffled. Um, in my experience, people will die for their footwear. No one really truly wants to believe that their footwear is the cause of some problems. Um, but you wouldn't um, believe how many are actually pretty narrow or tapered. And tapered just means um, the, the front of the shoe is, you know, that triangle kind of shape. Um, and when you have narrow or tapered footwear, essentially what happens is you're pretty much squishing your foot in a shoe. And with that, you're getting pressure on both sides from the shoe, even if it is just like a spandex um, kind of material, um, you're still getting that tiny, again, micro trauma pressure on your nail which uh, eventually if everything's getting squished together, um, you know, different pressures can start to happen on the nail um, and it can start to cause calluses um, and just a lot of pressure. So a lot of the times your nail can start digging into your skin. Um, genetics, um, a lot of times, unfortunately, people are just born with um, different shaped toes, different shaped bones. Maybe something is a little bit different. Maybe your nails are just a bit thicker. Maybe they're curved. Um, and these are a lot of the things that unfortunately we can't really do a lot about, but maintain. Um, and then a lot of the times what happens is um, if your nail is thick or if it is curved, naturally our skin will want to shed every 27 days. So when you think about it, that there is skin underneath our toenail as well, which does want to come out. But if your nail is curved, if there's a little bit of a callus buildup from tapered shoes, um, your nail is thick, sometimes that skin can get trapped under the nail. And when it starts to build and build and build, it'll start to press against the nail and it can cause a lot of pain. And eventually it can cause the nail to actually start to dig into the skin. So that is a lot of the times what I usually see. Um, especially with the debris buildup, it does happen a lot with nail polish. A lot of times the nail polish, when if you've, you've painted a little bit over onto your skin, it can really, it can cause the, the, the skin to be stuck in there, um, not allowing it to be released. And then an ingrown can start to build up. 
Um, I kind of already touched, talked about this, but if you do have a nail deformity or thick toenails, and a nail deformity again can be, you know, maybe you had fungus in your toenail and it's it's um, permanently traumatized your nail, or you drop something really big on your nail. And now your nail just comes back thicker. Um, that can also kind of lead to an ingrown. And then poor cutting techniques. Um, we'll kind of talk about this a little, a lot, not a little bit, but um, well, I normally see it when um, you know patients try to cut it and they they cut their nails way too short. Um, or they've angled it, whether or not it's yourself or if you got you went to a salon. Um, that weird, awkward picture I tried to draw on the computer is not very good, but um, that kind of depicts what I normally see. So people always think that their nails are what you can see. And a lot of the times the nails do grow um, a lot deeper than you would expect. So when people cut their nails, and a lot of the times they just can't cut it properly because if you are, if you do have deeper nails, um, sometimes you, your nail clippers can't get to it. So what happens is people will cut what they visibly can see. Um, and then they usually leave like that jagged edge and that jagged edge, when it starts, the nail continues to grow out, it'll start to dig in. So this is a lot of the times what I see with um, improper cutting techniques. Next slide. Um, so clinical presentation, I kind of wanted to show a bunch of um, a bunch of different versions. So you can have very mild cases, which is just a little redness. Um, you can have severe infected cases. You can have um, ones that are just a little bit pussy and it's a little bit cut improperly. And then as you can see the bottom left, that is like a genetic deformity in the nail where that is severely sticking in. And you can see um, if that's not treated properly or cut properly, it can cause ingrowns and infections. So a lot of the times um, you'll see a lot of redness. It can be painful. You can visually see a deformity or an angle in the toe, um, the toenail. You can see pus. Um, sometimes you'll see white or maceration. That's just like that thick white bogginess that you can see. You'll see a curved toenail. Um, hypergranulation tissue, that just describes, if you can look at the top left, unfortunately it's not great to look at, but um, you can see that there's like a little bit of a skin buildup kind of overlapping the nail. Um, and essentially what that is, is um, the body is trying to protect it. Cause even though the nail belongs to you, sometimes when it's digging into the skin, your body thinks it's a foreign object. So it's going to try and like attack it and then build up a lot of skin and callus around it to protect it. Unfortunately, this can just make it worse. Next slide. So this is just, I'm just trying to depict um, proper and improper cutting techniques and just showing you a visual representation of shoes. I mean, obviously when you think of like a dress shoe, whether it's a male dress shoe and it's tapered or a high heel, that's usually what everyone always thinks about. Like I don't wear heels. And a lot of times it's not the heels that you should be concerned about, but you can see just by looking how squished those toes are. And when the, you know, when the other toes and toenails are touching the other toes or the shoes, it can start to dig in. So that's why you always wanna make sure that you have a, a shoe that's fitting you properly width wise and length wise. Um, and then the proper cutting techniques, um, you know, everyone always says you have to cut straight. You have to cut straight. Um, I don't personally love that technique. Um, I like to cut the shape of your, your toe. Um, cause if you have a very rounded toe and you're, you're not going to obviously cut your nail straight across or else that can cause an ingrown. So I usually just say kind of generally follow the shape of your toe, which generally does come a bit more straight, but a lot of the times you do want to kind of take off those pointed corners a little bit. So, you know, we'll start from left. It's just, it's a very short toenail, which can cause all sorts of problems. When you round it too much, it's like almost the same as angling it, like the V shape. So when you V shape it like that or um, round it too much, essentially you can miss the corners of the nail and it can start to dig in. So treatment. So I kind of tried to do a little bit of what I would do um, and then what you guys can do. So obviously for me, um, I would take a very detailed history. Um, a lot of the times before I even see the toenail, I can usually figure out what's going on. Um, so did you go to a nail salon? Did you cut your nails recently? Things like that. Um, we're going to examine the area and figure out what kind of ingrown. Is there something digging in? Is it just pressure buildup? Things like that get a history of, did you have trauma, um, micro, um, major, did you have fungus? What are your shoes like? Things like that. 
Um, your activity level also has a lot to do with it because if you're a runner, if you're running side to side with tennis or squash or something like that, that is also excessive pressures and area of the foot that it's not used to. So it's always key to like know those information. Um, figure out how painful is it? How infected is it? Um, we can freeze the toe by injecting local anesthetic, which I won't lie. It can be quite painful. It's 30 seconds of burning to numb the foot. And then obviously it's no pain at all, which it can be the best case scenario. If it's a very, very painful toenail, um, obviously I will cut and clean up the toe, try to remove the ingrown, um, cleanse it with something sterile, like sterile water. Um, and then use some kind of antibiotic cream if it does bleed. Um, I usually let my patients go home with home treatments. You know, usually I'll do salt foot soaks. It's very antiseptic. It very it gets into the little tiny corners. It cleanses it. Um, put a little polysporin on it. Um, a lot of times I'll give footwear education because there's no point in treating something if we're not going to change the cause. Um, so kind of make sure that we can do that. Um, I can prescribe antibiotics depending. I mean, if you are on a lot of medications or do have a lot of health conditions, I will refer you back to your doctor just because a lot of antibiotics can cross um, with a bunch of drugs. So, um, and then we, we can do surgery. Um, I always say the rule of three. If it's been infected three times, um, you know, we might want to consider surgery. If it's something that you have to chronically live with, um, it might be your best option. Um, and then there's always bracing. I don't personally do the bracing at my offices, but I know some cropodists do. And um, essentially, um, they pretty much put this little gel that kind of goes across your nail. It is visible and it is visible the whole time. Um, and what it aims to do is it aims to like reshape your nail a little bit to help it not dig in so much. Um, I kind of, I've done a lot of research on this and I've talked to a lot of my colleagues about it because I really wanted to know more about it. And it does sound like it's extremely effective, but it is most likely only effective when you are wearing the brace itself. Um, once you remove it, your nail can just go back to being curved. So that's something you might want to consider. It's not as invasive as a surgery, um, but also something to consider. Um, so those are generally what I would do. Um, what you guys can do is if, you know, you can't get in to see someone, it's an ingrown, um, it's infected as I always just say, soak, soak the foot. So, um, get some table salt or vinegar or Epsom salt. Those are all very three different things, but they all have very antiseptic properties and soak your foot for 10 minutes. Um, and a lot of times that alone will kind of help soothe the pain. Um, you know, use something sterile, like a sterile gauze to kind of wipe away the area. Um, again, I don't love when patients treat themselves if it's an infected ingrown, but if, you know, worst case scenario, um, you can use a little bit of, um, like one of those like metal, um, emery boards that have a point on it, or, you know, how some nail clippers have a little point. You can use that to kind of examine the area. It's probably going to be painful. So what I usually suggest is try to see if you can outline your nail, um, with the tiny area without, you know, pricking yourself because a lot of the times you'll be able to tell right away um, where's the ingrown, where is it coming from? And if you are able to lift the area gently and just remove the source um, of the infection, great. A lot of times that can be extremely painful and obviously a lot better if you come in to see someone like myself to um, have it um, have it cut. Um, and then usually we'll, you know, you should cut it straight across. Um, clean it with um, a disinfectant, especially your um, instruments as well, because you don't want the bacteria from the infection to linger on it. Again, do another so um, foot soak with salt and vinegar, an antibiotic cream, um, cover it. And then obviously you want to look at your footwear options just to see if um, uh, you are wearing wide enough shoes. Um, so these, I just wanted to add these clips in just because um, I always hear these, you know, myths or wives tales, whatever you want to call them, the cotton under the nail or cutting your toe in a V because then your nail is going to collapse in and grow like this out and not in. Um, I mean, I don't hundred percent believe them. There's not a lot of validity behind them. I can see the point of the cotton just because it is lifting your nail from getting into the skin. Um, it is very difficult to do. A lot of the times people forget it's there and leave it there. And then that can become part of the infection. Um, so I usually just say it's better just to kind of cleanse the area and wipe it clean instead of trying to stick something non-sterile in there, especially because it, it is quite wispy. So it can get stuck. Um, and then cutting the nail, the V, I mean, our nails grow from, you know, the bottom of our nail up. 
So essentially, uh, if you cut it in a V, your whole nail is still just going to grow up instead of it does not grow in. So um, I don't, I haven't really had any um, luck with patients doing that. Some patients swear by it. And I'm a very person that if you believe it's going to work, it, it will work. So um, I won't, wouldn't really recommend that technique, but that is something you can do if you want. <laughs> So this is just kind of showing you how um, I would treat the nail. So you can see a painful infected ingrown. Those are kind of the instruments I use, nail nippers, black files, diamond dabs, all those things. So essentially you figure out where the source of the treatment of the nail is. Um, and like, again, what I pretty much will say is try to use your instrument and trace the, the nail, even though you have to go deep in there. You wanna see where is the ingrown happening? Is it broken off? Is it miss? Uh, is it like technique that's gone wrong? Um, is it just debris buildup? And then we pretty much will just cut what we need to cut out, um, clean it out, and whatnot. I, I again, I try to avoid cutting on an angle. Um, an angle is obviously if it's severely infected and we just need to get it out and then monitor it. I can see the point of that just because we need to get it out if it's that bad. But typically. I usually tell my patients my treatments are a little bit more painful because I really try to fix the ingrown right then and there instead of just cutting it on an angle. The problem with cutting on an angle um, is you're just pretty much encouraging the nail to continue to grow like that. So you've taken out the, the ingrown toenail. Um, it feels great, but you haven't really reshaped the nail. So when it starts to grow, it'll start to grow in more. So what I really try to do is I really try to maintain the shape and re and cut it and file it into a when it does grow out, it'll grow out straight instead of in. So um, that's essentially what I like to do. And then on the right, it, it just is showing a very basic idea of what the surgery would entail. Um, we would inject your toes um, to numb it. And then pretty much what we do is we lift the side of the nail. Um, this is quite aggressive. I wouldn't take this much nail out, um, to be honest. You just take the tiny little bit that's growing in. Um, you remove it with certain instruments and then we pretty much kill it, uh, with an acid. Um, the results are quite amazing. Um, you know, the nail could grow back a little bit, no surgeries ever a hundred percent. So that's something we deal with, um, as it comes. All right. Next one. Um, things to remember, um, some takeaways, um, cut your toenail, um, to the shape of your toe. Um, try to never angle the sides of your toenails. If it looks infected, do seek medical attention right away. Um, and a lot of the times, if you are taking an antibiotic, that's great. It'll definitely help with the infection. But you also have to remember if it is a nail that's digging in, we still need to treat that. Um, try not to touch or pick at it if it's infected because it'll just get worse. Um, our hands are surprisingly dirty. And if you're just really unsure, I always just say when in doubt, do a salt vinegar foot soak for 10 minutes, um, take an antibiotic cream and put it on and then cover with a Band-Aid. Um, mm -hmm. Belle, um, can, you, can you guys actually see me or no? I just had pictures to show, but if no one can see me, obviously I'm not gonna try. I'm not sure if you can talk now, okay. <laughs> All right, let's just continue on. So um, nail fungus. Um, again, I decided to show a large variety of different kinds of nail fungus. Um, as you can see the top right, um, it just shows a tiny little bit on the side, a little bit of yellow. Um, and then it as you can see, there's tons of different types of ingrowns, I mean, of uh, fungus um, going from very little to quite infected. Um, it's always lucky when a patient comes in and they have a little bit of discoloration because it's, it's easily treated with time. Um, but when you can see a, a visual um, nail deformity, okay, <laughs> um, it, it's thick, it's discolored, that's going to take some time. So to the next slide. So what is nail um, fungus? The technical definition, you know, a microorganism capable of colonizing in the skin, nails, and hair. Um, it does use um, skin, nails, and hairs as a source of nutrients. Fungus love to eat off of our body. I know that sounds really gross, but anytime it can get in or if it finds a trauma, it'll get in. 
Um, so if you ever see the word tinea, that usually means skin and onychomycosis is the nail fungus. And I'm just, I just show the three main types that can infect your nails. Not a lot of importance for you guys. Um, fungus can typically um, appear anywhere on the body. Um, if you have it in your nails, it can cross contaminate to your skin and vice versa. It's not just to your foot. Um, you know, a lot of times you, you've heard the word athlete's foot. That is a skin fungus. But again, it can appear anywhere on your body. Hence why um, I, you want to treat it right away. It is very contagious. Um, you know, if you touch your feet and touch your face, touch your arm, you can catch it on those other parts of the body. Um, and it's an opportunist infection. So pretty much what that means is uh, if you have a trauma on your body, and again, this goes for a lot of toenails. If you have traumatized it, you have hit it, you stubbed it, you're a runner and you've damaged it. Um, that little damage, um, if you come in contact with a fungus, it'll find a way under your nail and it'll make a nice little home for itself. Um, and it's quite difficult to get rid of when it's in your nail. Hi, Amanda. Um, apparently the uh, attendees can see you. Pardon? They can? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, don't know what I've been doing then. <laughs> Uh, okay, I just I'll, I'll kind of go back to the ingrowns. I just I forgot to put them in the slide. So I just really wanted to show you some. They're kind of gross just to let everyone know. So um, this is just an example of um, a severe deformed toe that we just kind of self treated they suffered from a lot of ingrown toenails, not a lot of infections, but a lot of pain. So um, hopefully you can see that. Okay. I'm not sure. So as you can see, the nail is quite deformed. And then with just simple treatment, um, we were able to kind of reshape the nail. The only thing with this is, this is something that you will need constant maintenance with, um, because if it is just the way your nail is, um, then essentially what's gonna happen is it's just gonna grow back that way. So um, that's just something we need to like constantly maintain. Um, the next one I wanted to show you is a different kind of ingrown. The patient had a trauma um, at the bottom of their toe um, where the nail grows out and it was just presented as a little tiny um, red mark, um, but she had traumatized it and it was digging in. Um, again, it's not the greatest looking picture, um, but we did the surgery and removed the whole nail and she healed up really well. And the nail eventually did make a full recovery. So. I'll just kind of show you. So that one was a severe kind of odd case that I've encountered, but um, the surgery really just, we didn't kill any of the nail off. We just removed it, cleansed it, and she recovered fully. Um, this is just an example of an ingrown I found in patient. Um, as you can see, they go quite deep. So um, that is a nail shard I took out from someone's toe. Uh, as you can see, it goes really long and deep. So it's sometimes when you think you've got the whole ingrown, um, you really have it. And that's why um, ingrowns can happen again and infections can happen again. Um, and then this was another case, severe, severe ingrown, so much so that the skin had almost covered the whole nail. Uh, again, just warning, it's not a great looking picture, um, but we did the surgery without the, the acid and killing it off. And um, the after picture is just, you know, a couple months after. Um, I don't have the picture of it way later, but made a full recovery. So um, the surgery can be quite beneficial um, if you know you are suffering from these severe cases. I also had a patient that every single toenail was severely infected. Um, and luckily um, we were able to treat it every three weeks and I'm not gonna lie, probably for three years. Um, and we didn't do any surgery. And I mean, it did take three years, but three years later, none of the toenails are infected. They're all, and they're not deformed anymore and they're all very nice looking. So uh, if you do have the patience and you can, you know, constantly treat it, you can, you know, treat the ingrown without the surgery. But again, um, infections are not fun. So sometimes if the surgery is something you just, you want to do um, to get it over with and you won't have to worry about it again, it's always great. My go-to is always surgery is a last case scenario. So um, if that is the case, I always try to treat it conservatively first because I don't want to do the surgery. Um, but if it's something that we both agree is for the best, then that's something that we would do. So sorry to backtrack there. Um, I really wanted to show you those pictures. So um, we'll continue on with the fungus. So how to diagnose fungus. Um, the main thing with fungus is honestly clinical presentation. Um, 
you know, if it looks like a fungus, um, it typically is a fungus. Um, there's all sorts of different kinds of tests you can do to see if it's fungus. The only problem with these tests are, um, they're not the most accurate, unfortunately. So I'll have some patients be like, oh, I had it tested, it's negative. And when you look at the nail, it's it's clearly fungus because a lot of the times, um, you know, 15% um, false positives. Um, the fungal culture, fungal cultures, it's 58% sensitivity. So these aren't extremely high. So my go-to is if it just looks like a fungus, treat it like a fungus. There's not a lot of side effects that can happen from treating um, the fungus unless it's the oral pill, which we will talk about. Um, so those are just different ways that you can diagnose a fungus. So uh, clinical presentation, um, you know, we saw a huge amount of different clinical presentations with the picture earlier. So typical ones are, is it discolored? Is it yellow? Is it white? Um, you know, if the top of your nail is a little discolored or even the sides, sometimes that can just be the nails lifted up just a little bit. It's when it starts to display, you know, the weird patterns, it's going down your nail, it's not growing out with your nail. That's when you want to be a little bit concerned. Um, is your nail thick? Um, is it crumbly? Um, it will have a different texture. It can grow different ways. It can have a foul smell if it is more of a fungus with a yeast. Um, and again, if it looks like a fungus, it's more than likely a fungus. Um, there's obviously a lot of differential diagnoses. Um, yeast, um, that one is a bit difficult to also treat. And a lot of the times it is hard to tell the difference between a fungus nail and if you just severely traumatized your toe. Typically they can go hand in hand, like I was saying, you know, an opportunist infection, but a lot of the times um, when you clean up the nail, you reduce the thickness and everything like that, you can tell if it's a fungus. A lot of the times, if your nail is just thick, you've treated it and it still looks like a nail, it's more than likely just traumatized. It's when it starts to collapse and cave and it becomes soft after you've treated it is when you know it is a fungus. The main thing here is the history. You need to ask the questions. Um, a lot of the times I'll always ask, you know, do you use nail polish? Do you go to pedicure salons? Do you walk barefoot uh, in public pools, hot tubs, showers? Um, do you travel a lot? Do you use bathrooms without flip-flops, which I know sounds weird, but you know, when you're traveling, you don't hundred percent know how they clean the bathtub. And again, if someone before you had a fungus, even if it's a close friend um, and you shower after them, you can pick up the fungus right after it. So there's, um, a lot of things. So we'll go to the next one. I think I just probably talked about half the slide. How do you get <laughs> nail fungus? Yeah. So like I was saying, it's very contagious. I'll have a lot of people come in and they'll, they touch their foot and they're like, what is this? And then they touch their face after. And I immediately get them hand sanitizer because um, it is very contagious. Um, you can, you pretty much get it directly through something that is infected. Um, so again, a traumatized toe walking barefoot. Oh, the main thing I always ask is, is yoga. There's so many people walking barefoot in yoga and I just, I don't trust anyone's foot. Honestly, I don't trust anyone's foot. So I usually suggest to my patients, you know, just wear socks when you're walking around the yoga studio, get to your mat, um, take the socks off and then have a great practice and then put the socks back on. Um, um, you know, barefoot and showers, gym showers, um, pedicure salons, a lot of the times, and I never like to talk down about any kind of business, but um, people, you know, pedicure salons have done so much to sterilize their instruments and disinfect them. But a lot of times people forget about the nail polish. If someone has toenail fungus and they use this nail polish, and they dip it back in the bottle. Unfortunately, that whole bottle's infected. And if you are the next lucky person to choose that color, more than likely you're gonna catch a fungus, unfortunately. Um, you know, sharing nail polish with someone who's had um, fungus, sharing nail clippers, cross-contaminating your nail clippers. If you do have a nail fungus and you've clipped it and then you clip your good nails, you can, you can um, cross-contaminate to the other nails. Uh, I just really wanted to do a brief slide on athlete's foot just to show the skin side of it. So um, again, it, it's, you contract it the exact same way as you would um, a nail fungus. And these are great pictures because a lot of times it's very hard to dis distinguish um, if a nail fungus is, fun I mean, if a skin fungus is skin or if it's just dry skin. And the main difference is um, the, the dry skin will look like little blisters have popped everywhere. And I know that's a weird description, but you can see on the bottom of these pictures, it, it looks like the skin is torn. Um, so that is essentially how you can mainly differentiate if it is dry skin or a fungus. 
Fungus also will follow what we call a moccasin distribution. So if you've ever worn a moccasin shoe, you know how the top of your foot is, it's open. So fungus will pretty much generally show up anywhere where a moccasin touches your foot. So that's something to also kind of keep in mind. If you look between your toes and they're very white macerated, sore looking like the top um, picture, Again, that is a fungus as well. And again, you can cross contaminate. If you started with a foot fungus, it can cross contaminate to the nails and then vice versa. Next slide. So treatments, um, I've, I've, I've split it up. So um, the nail, unfortunately the nail is quite difficult to treat. There's all sorts of new things that have come out, but really all you need is time. And I know no one loves to hear that as a treatment. Um, our nail grows one millimeter a month. That is nothing. So if you've added a trauma in there, a nail fungus, it could even grow half a millimeter. So it just takes time. So um, the main thing, honestly, is to treat it with an ointment. Um, Jubilia, it's a prescribed um, nail ointment. It's prescribed by doctors. We don't have the privileges yet to prescribe it. Um, it it's quite expensive and it's in a little bottle. So if you have benefits, perfect. Uh, it's, it's very effective. Um, you would apply it one, time, one to two times a day. Um, Unfortunately, for six to 12 months, um, it does take a long time. And that just depends if it, how severe it is. If your nail is severely thick, um, it could take longer than that, unfortunately. Um, tons of over-the-counter um, antifungals I usually just prescribe to my, or tell my patients to go and get um, $16 for a massive bottle. The main one I usually do is Fungi Cure. It's quite effective. Um, another prescribed one is Penlac. It's not my favorite because Penlac is extremely hard to use. It's, a, it's, it's pretty much like a nail lacquer and you paint it on like nail polish and it just builds and builds and builds. And then once a week, you have to take it off. A lot of the times there's not great adherence to, to taking it off. And then we just get this thick um, it's not great. I just, I typically don't suggest it. I usually just say, get the over-the-counter one. Um, so that's usually what, um, the ointment is. The thing is with skin and nail fungus is they're not the same treatments. So you use them the same amount of time. Um, but you can't use the cream for the nail and the nail ointment for the skin. Um, our skin is very water soluble and our nail is very fat soluble. So if you use like a Lamisil cream, which we'll talk about on your nail, that's not penetrating at all. We need an ointment that can penetrate the fatty top layer of the of the nail. So that's why you shouldn't use cream for the nails and the ointments for the skin, just to keep in mind. Um, the other thing is um, Lamisil Oral. This used to be a big thing years ago. Um, I don't know how great the results were. Uh, it's very, very, very hard on your liver. So if your doctor has prescribed this, more than likely you're getting blood tests every three months because it's so hard on your liver and they have to monitor it. Um, consistent nail treatment, you know, if you do have the discoloration, if it's very thick, we need to thin that nail out. So a lot of times my patients will come see me. Um, I usually say every three months, um, I'll cut them. I take my handy little nail drill and I thin them right down. Um, so your ointment can penetrate better. Um, laser, I've, I've heard a lot of talk about the laser, um, recent studies came out to say that it doesn't actually kill the fungus. Um, it essentially just makes the nail look better. Um, some, some clinics still do it and they have great results. So that's, that's awesome. We don't do the laser at our clinic. Um, I, I worked with a doctor who was obsessed with vapor rub. Um, there is a lot of antifungal properties to vapor rub. Apparently, um, I probably wouldn't recommend it, but apparently that's a thing. Um, for the skin, it's, skin is so easy to treat. You essentially can get a, a prescribed um, antifungal cream from myself or a doctor, or you can get an over-the-counter one. Both are just equally effective. Um, you apply it twice a day for 48 weeks and it'll be gone. It's so easy to treat the skin. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, and those are just um, different examples of the names you can get. The Lamisil is the prescribed one. The ketoconazole, myconazole, and clotrimazole, those are all over the counter. You can literally find them in the foot section um, and they're extremely effective. Um, some other things I pretty much, I'll educate my patients a lot with this. Um, I always say, you know, disinfect your shoes. Um, fungus spores can linger. So you wanna disinfect them. Um, you can use UV lights to do that. Disinfect your bathing area. If you've showered, um, disinfect it afterwards. Cause again, you can cross contaminate to the other foot other people, things like that. Um, 
what else do I usually say? I usually say, you know, wash your underwear and your socks separately for obvious reasons. Um, and a lot of the times, if you do have the foot fungus or even nail fungus, I always just tell my patients, be very careful when you are putting underwear on or leggings, because if your foot touches the crotch area of your underwear or pants, and then you pull it up and that's touching, you know, around your sensitive areas, you can, that's how you get jock itch. So unfortunately, just always be very careful and mindful of how contagious it can be. Um, the other treatment as well is um, we can do nail surgeries for this. It's not 100% guaranteed. Sometimes when the nail is so thick, patients just want it to be removed and see what happens if it grows back. I haven't done one of these. I've only done one in my entire career. It was okay. It, it worked, but it's just not something I would 100% suggest, but there's always that option as well. Um, the troubles with treatment. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to cure because our nails grow so slow um, and patients get frustrated. It'll be three months. Patients are like, I don't see a difference. They stopped using the ointment. And that's when you have to keep using it. You have to think about it. If you're looking at your toe every single day for three months, you are not going to notice a difference of it growing out, but it is working. And the whole point of the ointment is it's killing the fungus, but it's protecting that new nail when it grows out. So the fungus doesn't keep spreading down. So you just, the main thing is you just have to be like very consistent. Um, footwear occlusion is a big thing of why, you know, it doesn't heal because if you're putting your foot in a closed toe shoe, um, it's really dark, it's moist, fungus love that. So just things to kind of keep in mind. Is your nail traumatized? That's also hard. If you do have decreased circulation, you can get reinfected quite easily. Um, talked about that. Inconsistent treatments. Um, you do have to be quite consistent with the, with the treatments. Just when you think it's gone, there'll be one tiny thing left and it'll come back full force. So, you know, finish the prescription. If it's four to eight weeks, I usually say use it for the eight weeks, because even if it looks gone, it's not fully gone. The nail, same with the nail, that one takes a lot longer. And I usually follow my patients throughout their whole journey. So I usually will tell them when they can stop. Um, and it's just really, really easy to reinfect. Kind of like I said, if, you know, you do like to travel a lot um, or you share showers, um, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I, um, I'll wear sandals and like my friends shower. I know it's probably rude. Um, or even when I travel, just cause I just don't trust, um, I don't trust the bathtub. Um, you can always just bring disinfectant wipes as well, but that's just me. And, you know, I see worst case scenarios and that's why I think the way I do. <laughs> okay. Next slide. Um, home remedies. Um, there's not a lot of FDA to support behind this, but my patients, some of them swear by this. The main thing I will always tell my patients is I really like the apple cider vinegar or tea tree oil. You can always just do a nice foot soak, you know, get some warm water, some Epsom salts, apple cider vinegar or tea tree oil, and just have a 10 minute foot soak. Um, it's a, it's an adjunctive therapy and it, it'll help with the, the treatment. So, and then key points to take away consistent treatments you know, protect your feet. If you're in public areas, wear sandals, wear water shoes, things like that. Dry your feet properly, prevent skin openings, um, you know, just educate yourself. Um, and you know, if you do love going to the nail salon, that's completely fine. I usually just tell my patients, bring your own clear coat and your own, um, your own color. Um, I know the whole point of going to nail salon is to get a cool color you don't normally get. Um, but you know, it's, it's a long treatment and I usually just suggest this. And even if you already have nail fungus, um, and you, you want to wear nail polish, if it's the summer or you're going away or something like that, um, there are nail polishes you can get online that have tea tree oil in it. So, you know, you're kind of getting a treatment as you have the nail polish, um, or, you know, if you have one really bad looking nail, I usually say like, you know, invest in a nice color, a nice basic color, like red, and then go to the dollar store and buy another red. So you can on all your non-infected nails, you can use the good nail polish. And then on your fungal nail, just use the dollar store one that you can just throw away right away. Um, if you do have nail fungus currently, and you have been using nail polish, I'd probably throw them out just to be preventative. Last but not least, warts, my favorite thing to talk about. Um, uh, I've been seeing a lot of warts recently because, um, you know, it's after summer, people have been barefoot at pools and things like that. Unfortunately, um, their kids have given it to the parents. So it's, it's been, um, it's been fun. <laughs> Next slide. So these are just, I mean, worst case scenario warts. I mean, um, 
You can get little individual warts that look just like a corn, or you can get a bunch of warts that have kind of bunched together. And essentially those are just different kinds of warts. Um, warts are the HPV virus, not the same as the cervical cancer. So that has nothing to do with it, but it is a virus. And as we've kind of seen with COVID, virus are smart, they evolve. So they are very difficult to get rid of. Next slide. Um, so Veruca pedis is what they're um, technically called warts. They spread by contact and appear at sites of microtrauma or irritation. I'm, sometimes I have a hard time believing this because a lot of patients will have, they won't have any opening and they still can contract a wart. So just always be mindful of that. Um, variations in immunity can also explain, um, you know, people who are more susceptible to getting warts and whatnot. Um, I just think some people are just more susceptible than others, regardless of their immunity. Sometimes I just think the certain kind of skins, um, you know, make it easily. I'll see, you know, siblings, one sibling gets a hundred of them and the other one has never got one. So it, I just think some people are more susceptible to it. Um, appearances, um, we'll have a picture of a corn versus a wart. So we'll get through that, but how you can mainly tell the difference is it will usually look like this rough patchy area, like a little bit of a cauliflower. Um, it'll have little black dots in it um, and it'll, dis it'll disrupt your skin lines. The only other thing that can grow in your body that'll disrupt the skin lines, and it doesn't even grow, that's my bad, it's a scar. If you have scar tissue, that'll disrupt your skin lines. So if you have, you know, even if you have a, a callus or a corn, you can still see your little skin lines through it. So that's a one way you can definitely tell if it's a wart. Um, they can be some different colors, they can be different shapes, locations, and typically they will hurt when you squeeze them laterally, not pressing down on them. When you squish them from side to side, typically they will hurt. To be fair, not all warts will be the same and not all will have all of these, um, but just some things to look for. Um, a lot of times people think that warts are extremely deep and they're not. So, you know, we have our skin layers, the epidermis, and then we have the dermis, which is very, very um, deeper than the epidermis. Um, and there's about seven layers of the epidermis, give or take. It sits in about the fifth layer and each layer is not even a millimeter. So they're not technically that deep. They're just very persistent. <laughs> okay, next slide. Um, this is just showing you different types of warts and there's so many different kinds. So even if we treat for one, um, uh, you can catch a different one. So always things to keep in mind and why it's so difficult to treat warts. The next slide. Perfect. This is showing a corn versus a wart. So the corn is on the left side. As you can see, they look extremely similar. And if it's on the bottom of your foot and it's a wart, your body will have felt the wart and it'll be like, oh, this feels uncomfortable. So sometimes it'll make callus on top of the wart, which makes it extremely more difficult to figure out if it's a corn or it's a wart. But you can just kind of see um, the corn, you know, it's, it's a solid color. It's protruding a little bit. You can't really see the skin lines in this picture, but you can clearly tell that the skin lines are disrupted in the one on the right. Um, it looks rough. It's cauliflower looking. It's a little callus and it has the black dots. And again, when it's the bottom of your foot, it's very difficult to like see it yourself. So that's why we usually tell patients just to come in when in doubt. How do you catch it? It's very similar to fungus. They are very contagious. You know, some patients will have, unfortunately, hundreds. I've seen it, hundreds on their foot. And then one patient will have one that they've had for 10 years. So again, it just really, they are contagious. I don't know how contagious they are um, to the person itself, to other people. I do think different kinds of warts are, are different varies of contagiousness. Um, but again, you get it through direct contact, walking barefoot, pools, hot tubs, showers, gym showers, yoga, um, I don't, I don't see them a lot with pedicure salons. Sometimes I have seen a bunch of cases where they have nipped um, the nail, the, the skin beside the nail and a wart has grown there, unfortunately. So something to be um, aware of. And then again, just sharing showers uh, with other people with warts, if you're home traveling, things like that. Next slide. Um, treatment. The main thing I really try to promote is boosting that immune system, um, you know, it's the foods that we eat, you know, dark leafy greens, berries, whole grains, green tea. Let's boost that antioxidants. Um, why not? It's flu season, so it'll help both ways. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't really like to suggest supplements, but there is a lot of studies suggesting, you know, vitamin A, zinc sulfate, um, very good for skin's, skin with wart on it. It has a great skin turnover. Um, 
medicine. So I have been prescribing this a lot. Um, Eldera and Micomod. It's an immune booster. Um, it is quite expensive. I, I'm throwing that out there. It is about $400. Um, if you do have private insurance, amazing. Um, if not, we'll find other ways to kind of help it. But I have been using this a lot lately for those very, very, very tricky warts. Um, I had one patient, I actually have a photo that I'll show you. Um, he, they only had like five warts. Um, we treated it, got it down to one tiny little one. The next time they came in, all of a sudden there was hundreds and hundreds of warts everywhere. No idea what happened. Very confusing. And it was in a very odd place that you couldn't really treat it effectively. So I was like, let's just try this. Honestly, within three months of using the Aldera, every single wart was gone. I was even mind blown. Um, so it really does work. It is a very aggressive treatment. Um, but it's something we would talk about and if it's a right fit for you. Um, topical treatments, liquid nitrogen, panthacur, it's a very aggressive um, acid that's made from a blistering beetle actually. And unfortunately, this has been on back, back ordered for months and months and months and months. So if you can find a chiropodist that has this, that's amazing. I somehow have some left. I'm so thankful. So um, that's a great aggressive treatment. Um, you know, prescribing salicylic acid, lactic acid, things like that. You can get them over the counter, but they're not as high as the percentage. Silver nitrate um, over the counter products, zinc, salt, zinc oxide. There's been some studies about that. The main thing to take away um, with topical treatments is they don't usually go away with one treatment. I can't give a prognosis. Like I've treated a wart in one treatment. I've treated some warts in 10 plus treatments. It's viruses are tricky. They're persistent. They change. Um, there's no way to get rid of a wart without, you know, absolutely destroying it. That's how you get rid of a wart. So um, destroying something is usually quite painful. So um, always keep that in mind. If it is someone who cannot deal with pain very well, um, or a child, um, a lot of the times we'll do silver nitrate um, treatments. It turns the area black and there's no pain. It's a low grade acid, so it does take more time, um, but there's always that option. And same with, I usually prescribe all my patients with um, salicylic acid, a high percentage of it, because you're gonna only see me once every week, once every three, four weeks, whatever you choose to do. So I love to give patients an option to treat themselves at home. Um, wives tails, you know, duct tape, banana peel, garlic, I've seen all of that. And essentially what all of these treatments are doing is you're trying to irritate the skin. So the immune system pretty much gets involved. So the immune system, the thing is with the ward is it's strategic. It sits in that fifth layer of the skin, like I told you, um, right above the immune system. The immune system will start to happen in the dermis. So um, warts can just thrive and spread in our skin and our body has no idea it's there. Um, that's why, you know, when you attack it with acids or duct tape and things like that, we're trying to irritate that wart as much as possible so the immune system can kick in. Because honestly, once the immune system kicks in, that wart will you get treated right away. Next slide. Um, other treatments, um, laser, um, it's a very specific laser machine. So if you are looking for this, you have to ask if it's the wart laser and not just like a muscle laser machine. It's very effective, very painful, but very effective. Uh, we don't have the wart laser machine at our clinics, but I know some do. Um, surgery, I do do a lot of surgeries for the warts. There's wart needling and wart excision. I've, I've had quite success with these um, wart needling. Um, you know, we inject the foot. It, it's quite painful injecting the bottom of the foot. It's a needle in the bottom of the foot, but it's quite easy. It's quite quick. And then essentially what it sounds like, we take a needle and then we puncture the wart hundreds and hundreds of times because the thought is that um, we're destroying it and we're also pushing it into the immune system, into the blood. Um, so the body will create a response and typically it'll treat all of the warts on the foot. Um, I do a lot of the ward excisions, especially if it's just one or two, eject the bottom of the foot. And we essentially just cut that ward out and then kill it with an acid. It's quite effective. Um, you know, wart needling is a little less aggressive. So I've had patients say they went dancing the night of and they were fine. I've had patients say they were a little tenderness for a week. You don't need to take any time off for any of the surgeries, including the nail surgeries. It's just pain is tolerated. You're not going to obviously go for a run the next day. Um, so just keep that in mind. The ward excision is a little bit more aggressive just because um, we are cutting a hole in your foot. So patients usually say they have discomfort for about one or two weeks, but then it's, it's quite good after that. Um, 
these are just some stats that I found that they said 20 to 30% disappear after six months alone and 60% with two years. I, again, I don't hundred percent believe that warts go away on their own sometimes maybe, but if you can just treat it, I usually say that's the best suggestion just because it's quite contagious. You can spread it to other parts of your body. You can spread it to others. Um, I'm just going to kind of show you those two pictures I had. Um, I think I only have one. So one is of the wart surgery or I have, oh, I think I have a picture on the thing, but this is what the wart excision, excision surgery looked like. Um, before, and then I just have pieces of the, the skin I cut out. I'm getting sorry, it's probably gross. Um, but you, it just goes to show how big these warts are. So um, that's essentially the skin warts that those are just warts. That's not even skin. That was just the warts that I pulled out. So this patient made a full recovery. It was amazing. So um, that's just kind of a little bit of what the wart excision surgery looks like. Um, next slide. Sorry, we're um, I talk a lot, sorry. Um, this is my patient actually that, um, as you can see, he had one wart left after we were treating it. And then all of a sudden you can see those are hundreds and hundreds of warts that have all come together. Um, I couldn't believe it. This is after I debrided it and you can see all those black dots everywhere. And it's because it's in between the toe, the bone is right there. So it makes the area very difficult to treat. The skin is so sensitive. It is so thin. Um, so you have to be very diligent and you can't really use the acid on warts when there's a hundred of them because it almost makes it worse because um, when you use an acid and it creates a blister, pretty much you create a moist area and warts will thrive in that. So it's, it's a very tricky thing. So we pretty much, um, he was using the salicylic acid and I prescribed him the Aldera um, and then he'd come in for debridement. I would just take down the excessive skin. I, I did silver nitrate. And honestly, three months later, he came back and it was gone. All the words, I couldn't believe it. So um, great success with the Aldera. Um, again, you want to use it every three days. It, it can cause a lot of irritation and tingly. So again, it's everything is on a patient to patient basis. We monitor you very closely. So next one. So yeah, this is another patient who had these two massive warts on the same foot for years and years and years, tried everything like eight months of liquid nitrogen, nothing, nothing worked. So um, we did the excision, excision surgery and we just cut them both out. Um, and then as you can see, the foot on the right was three months later. So very successful case with this one um, as well. Next slide, prevention. Again, extremely contagious. Don't touch with your hands. If you do wash them right away, um, do you have a cut on your hand? Make sure you cover them, especially if you're treating warts. Um, try to avoid walking barefoot, you know, slip that sandal or water shoe on. Um, disinfect bathing air, shoes, your hands, and try and boost your immune system. Um, yeah, so that's it. Sorry, I talk a lot. <laughs> um, uh, again, everything I've kind of just described to you, that is just based on my own experience, um, what I have found to work for me and my patients. Many different practitioners will have different thoughts as well, and that is completely okay. And again, everyone is very individualized. So, you know, we come up with a treatment plan that works best for you, for me, the compromise and things like that. So, um, yeah, I'm thirsty. Um, and those are just other treatments I do. So um, thanks for tuning in, everyone. I'm not sure if there's questions. Um, we do, we do offer free phone consultations and, um, what I usually typically do, if it is something like an ingrown award or something like that, there's my email. Um, I tell my patients, take a picture of it and send it to me. So, um, if you do want a free phone co consult and you are questioning something, try your best to take a picture, um, and send it to the email. And then as we talk, I can have a look at it. So, yeah, we just have one question, uh, how best to sanitize your shoes? Yeah, so um, there is a special spray you kind of can get on the internet, um, and it's just like a fungus spray. And essentially what you do is um, you can use like a disinfectant spray. I mean, especially with COVID, I think we all have disinfectant sprays now. Um, you just take it and you literally just douse the inside of your shoe um, and let them completely dry. And then every time you do wear the shoe, just um, disinfect it a little bit. You can use a UV light system. But it is extremely um, expensive. There are some things on the market which have some silver and they look like little insoles. Um, I'm actually talking to someone right now and trying to get some in for my clinic. And you just stick them in your shoes and pretty much that silver will just kill everything in there. Um, so those are 
the easiest ways to kind of disinfect your shoes. Okay, and any questions, any more questions for mm -hmm. Amanda? If you do, again, you can just um, send me an email or a phone console. I think there's one. Okay, there's one. Okay. Do you treat toddlers? Yeah, I do. I treat all ages. I've seen like six months old to the other end. So, yep. Mm -hmm. It just, yeah, it depends with kids. It depends as well, um, especially depending on what it is. So we obviously try to do the, the less aggressive treatment for them. So, mm -hmm. 